I'd like to thank the President, Dr. Holmes, and the Trustee Board for giving all of us an opportunity to serve uh, here at United Institutional, I mean, I'm sorry, United uh, Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities. I'd also like to thank Dr. Mertz for uh, going between Musa and <laughs> and Nancy and myself. The uh, Too Close, that's one of the best renditions I heard of Too Close in a long time. You can't sing Too Close without feeling that one. And uh, you almost ran me. <laughs> but uh, I could not behave that way, considering I was uh, part of this august group of, of gentlemen who are being uh, in, uh, installed tonight. <laughs> but if I'd have took off, I'd have still been running when the men in white jackets came to get me. <laughs> I want to thank you for that. A voice beyond the echo. A voice of noise from the city a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that renders recompense to God's enemies, Isaiah 66, 6. The great challenge facing the American Christian church today is the degree to which American Christians have collapsed their Christian faith into their national identity a national identity always already inflected by whiteness and race. But even beyond that, something far more cynically sinister than the stale embrace of an outmoded alchemy for the assign assignation of human value and worth seems to be at play. The American church seems to be locked into a self-referential system in which American values, assumptions, and views are the determining criteria of truth, where our national aims, democratic values, interpretation of freedom, identity politics, whether preoccupation with inclusions or exclusions, the spread of capitalism, sexual obsessions, are functionally identified with the gospel of Christ. It is not so much that this or that particular ideological configuration is rightly or wrongly identified with the word of God, but rather that any ideological configuration is at any time identified with the word of God. We must take care that our theology, our scholarship, our Christian ed, our preaching, indeed our God, is never reduced to merely an echo or pale reflection of who we happen to be in every given moment or in any given moment or stretch of time. Just another cultural artifact marked and marred by the human predicament, simply reaffirming our distinct sense of privilege and pride, however thinly veiled behind pietistic protestations of righteous intentions, justified causes, and justifiable deviations from the call of Christ to abandon the self. Relativize all earthly commitments to men and nations with all that that entails, and shun all pretensions, take up his cross, and follow him. There is a reason Narcissus and Echo are so closely associated in Greek mythology. They are, in a sense, echoes and reflections of the same or similar phenomena, at the very least inflected iterations of inextricably related stuff. There are many versions, I suppose, of these tales of the gods, but Edith Hamilton makes mention that Narcissus could not embrace the love of another, and so the god Nemesis condemned him to love only himself. When she struck, he happened to be gazing at himself in a pool and suddenly love-struck could not bear to relinquish his own reflection. He could love no one else, see no value in no one else, only in a reflection of himself. He did not love the water he was looking at, but rather the reflection of himself in it, just as some people cannot embrace the otherness in the American culture, but only the pale reflection of the American 
it already and only sees in itself and a Christian faith that affirms and reflects what it sees. While I don't have time to go into it here, I think Heinz Kohut was on to something when he found that in the American clinical context, however committed we seem to be to the Victorian morality that structured the mental sensibilities of the Western psyche, there was something deeper and in some ways more troubling going on. As he peered deeper, he found that narcissism in its primary and secondary manifestations broadly characterized the phenomena he saw. I think this has everything to do with the American theocultural predicament across the board. When Echo was arbitrarily chastised by Hera, frustrated by her own preoccupation with the wayward attention of Zeus, she condemned the chatty little nymph to a state in which she could never speak unless she repeated in response the words of another. This is an element in all asymmetrical relations of power. The effort to completely muzzle those who are powerless so those in and with power can monopolize meaning. This way, they never have to hear anything but what they have programmed you to repeat, which inevitably preserves the status quo. Hera, in that arbitrary imposition of force on one who before her was helpless, severed the connection between voice and initiative, so that when Echo did speak, she was compelled to speak not her own words, but those of another, to express not her own will, but rather that of another, not her own heart, but the thoughts and feelings of her godlike mistress. Listen to Edith Hamilton's phrasing of the dialogue as she attempts to harvest the meaning of the myth. You will always have the last word, but no power to speak the first. The first word or voice sets the agenda. Everything thereafter conforms to its contours. Because of the arbitrary imposition of power embedded in systemic relations that pre-exist any particular conversation, there is a lot in our cultural, political, and more importantly, theological conversations today that is indeed little more than an echo. Echoes, by the way, can exercise no critical judgment, unless, of course, someone with voice has done so already. As a matter of fact, being reduced to an echo may be the worst form of oppression, the most diabolical and, in the end, dastardly of all abuses of power because it completely effaces the other, making the person's voice disappear in its own sound, its being in its own bodily image, an absent made all the more manifest in its own presence, because the powerful other will only see and hear themselves and will not suffer the other to be. What is even more spiritually and theologically egregious is when preaching and the preacher are reduced to echoes. Not the sonorous soundings that search out the depth of the culture and spiritual life of the nation. Not those who read the echo to map out the topological structure of the existential terrain for purposes of prophetic engagement. No, I'm speaking of those who have succumbed to the imposition of power, cultural conformity and complacency and have themselves become an echo of the interest of power and exploitation in the spiritual life of American culture. What happens when preaching becomes only the echo of the assumptions upon which both their comfort and the order of asymmetrical relations of power have come to rest? What happens when preaching is reduced to no more than a reflection of the rosy face of a made-up culture whose death and decay are hidden behind a cosmetic mask of commercial materialism? What happens to a nation gone mad with its own image that cannot turn away from the obsessive, obsessive gaze of its delusional beauty and the church has collapsed its word, supposedly God's word, into a divinely tinged echo of its megalomaniacal assumption? What happens when God and country are fused into one image and their voices collapse into little more than a self-congratulatory call and response, singing out the ideal of the American self of triumphant reiteration in an exceptionalist refrain. Christian preaching, the church, theology, must mediate the voice beyond the echo. 
the voice that breaks the cycle of spiritual insanity and sets us on a path toward real redemption, that frees us from the paralytic love of our own image and the hypnotic allure of our own echo. Did not Christ call Peter from his gazing in mundane and overworked waters to the shores of a greater sea where the inlets, heavily populated with prolific possibility, teem with life, filling once empty nets chock full to overflowing with new life and deep joy. The voice beyond the echo relativizes all earthly commitments, identifications, systems, and loyalties, calling us to embrace a transcendent destiny, reflecting in our vision the universal presence of a merciful God. It summons us through higher life and deeper commitments to a reality not yet here, nor captured in any man-made system or city, but embraced in the word of promise from the region beyond the stone-faced echo in the kingdoms of this world. The writers of Hebrews reminds us in the 11th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. But they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Yes. Lord, lift me up yes. and let me stand yes. by faith on heaven, yes. table land. No higher plane than I have found. I'm feeling a bit like Torsten right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You have heard the profession. You have heard the word being spoken. You have heard the word reverberate in your heart. You know the story. You are the story. This is the word that calls us forth. Let us know that we are commissioned, each one of us, both as professors, as board, as students, as staff, as those who are tied to this place. Let us know that we are called forth. Please join with me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for how you have called together all of these people, all of these stories, these lives that have asked. You have asked us to take a risk, to be together in a way which maybe no one has done before, but in a way that has called us to a new place, to a higher ground. This is the word that you speak into our hearts. This is the story you have placed within us. You tell us, I'm about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will bring rivers to the desert to dr give drink to my people. Let us drink fully. Let us know that we are nourished, that we are a sea of Galilee, that we are not stuck, that we are not contained, but that simply that your prophecy may come through us, that we may be vessels to speak a word that might be prophetic, that might be hard to hear, that might be discomforting in the moment, but that brings us to a different place, a newer understanding, a fullness, a shalom of life. Let us live this. Let us know that we offer this as well, that we may be your waters, that mean we be your word, that we may go forth into this ministry in whatever way that we are called, that we are yours. And may we offer this gift of love, of the prophetic, of teaching, of profession, of ministry, of healing, that it be a word from you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. And let all God's people say together, amen. amen. We ask you standing or sitting to, uh, to join together, rise in spirit and joining in our final hymn as we go forth.